I'm Ariane Elfant, and this is Death the Podcast. Death can be defined as the destruction or permanent end of something. At Death the Podcast, we are looking closely at what happens when something ends. We listen, learn about, and discuss the stories that surround the subject of death. These stories bring up much more than feelings of fear and sadness. They offer opportunities for connection, for hope, and sometimes even for humor. Ultimately, if we are open to exploring death, we create greater potential to experience life. My guest today is Dr. Joseph Sims. In 1996, Joe, then an emergency doctor in Maine, faced a health crisis that would change both his life and his career path. Joe was diagnosed with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, a rare form of cancer. This kind of cancer has a better prognosis than the cancer of the pancreas most of us are familiar with. But in 2011, Joe suffered from gastrointestinal bleeding of unknown cause that would not stop. This health crisis forced him to take a sabbatical from his work and reorient his life around what was happening inside his own body. After recovering, Joe began to focus more fully on his health and well-being. He was also motivated to expand his area of specialty to hospice and palliative medicine. I wanted very much to have Joe on Death the Podcast, not only to learn more about palliative care and hospice, but also to examine more closely what happens when the man who has devoted his life to caring for others in life and in death faces his own mortality. Joe, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, uh, Ariane. Going from a white coat to a hospital gown, from doctor to patient, what was that like for you? Well, the most, uh, gosh, what just flashed into my mind was being in Johns Hopkins Hospital being sent down for a CT scan. And this was back in 1996. And I was about to have major surgery. uh, And we didn't really know where things were going. And it seemed like I was left down there kind of cold for a long time. And I remember at one point being wheeled by a radiologist who you could just tell he was just robustly handsome and he had his Virgin Islands tan on (laughs) and he didn't even see me as I went by. I felt like I was invisible to him. (laughs) So I had this feeling that I had dropped into a different world, almost like being put in jail or something, something really profoundly different. Uh, it was uh, wrapped up in my impression at that time was that that uh, the empathy and compassion was very difficult for people who have never experienced uh, 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 severe setbacks. And and for you, kind of then seeing it that as you were, you know, waiting for your CT scan from from the other side, from the patient side, was there an awareness for you of maybe having looked at people um, in, a, in, in that kind of way where you were passed by by the guy with the suntan as in the physician role? I think that's uh, true. I'm not sure I reflected on it very much at that time, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, later, I uh, uh, did some writing about patient-physician uh, relationship, and uh, uh, actually, I stopped wearing a, a white coat after I went back to work in 2000 and uh, in 1998 uh, because I felt that the white coat sort of represented an asymmetry and an uh, and an unapproachability that was uh, uh, really undesirable in, in, in a physician. Yeah. But I, you know, clearly, uh, if you look at the practice, for instance, here in New Orleans, uh, I mean, uh, white coats and scrubs are very in for that tribe. <laughs> you, don't, you don't really see uh, doctors just wearing a, uh, a, a uh, you know, a striped shirt. When I'm hearing you talk, I'm also hearing that um, maybe specifically for people who are facing very um, serious conditions that more of a a 
collaboration between patient and doctor might be useful. I think it's even a dance. You're, you're really looking for the music together. And some people that you dance with, you get your, sto- your toes stepped on or you uh, just can't get the rhythm right or how to move around the, the ballroom. I mean, I really think uh, it, it, it's like a dance. They used to use a term, still used a lot in medicine, of, oh, the patient's non-compliant, meaning they're not doing what I tell them to do. Uh, about a decade ago, I read a really nice article by, uh, by a doctor talking about concordance, which is, you know, really a, a, there's needs to be a resonance, a a, a, a bi-directional dynamic to this interaction, and and it's I really think um, if you can find the music together, that's good. So, in terms of your own care, um, with with your with the obstacles you faced health wise, what what worked and what didn't work? Being a physician has is it kind of cuts both ways. On one level, you feel like you're a little bit entitled, especially if you're working through your own med- hospital or medical staff. You know the system, so you you know how to sort of cut through the cut to the chase and get a lab test done, or or you can even order something for yourself. And that's, you know, that's kind of nice. But I also ran into physicians that were really put off their usual game because they were dealing with a with a, another physician, someone who in some cases they thought was more educated and knew more than I probably did. But, but you could see that they were sometimes uncomfortable because some of their Wizard of Oz uh, magic wouldn't work on me because I've seen so many bad things happen <laughs> in hospitals, I guess, after, you know, 25 years. Mm-hmm. So so in terms of working with physicians, they're, they're, uh, sometimes I've had wonderful physicians and then sometimes I've, I've really kissed frogs. And uh, even in the best of institutions. What do you do when you, when you kiss a frog as a physician? Well, not too long ago, I had a, a cardiologist, and she was someone who I really respected and liked, having worked with her and uh, with, with patients in common from the emergency department. And I developed uh, uh, a so-called congestive heart failure based from a, a, a medication for uh, a targeted medication for my tumor. And... Uh, as I was talking to her and she said, well, basically, this isn't going to get better. And uh, and you'll have to, this is the only thing that's evidence-based. You have to take this drug at this dose and, you know, the rest of your life. And then she, had, she was standing there with her hand on the doorknob to leave the room. And I had so many questions. And so basically I fired her, got, got went to a different hospital system and got a different cardiologist. Uh, that is one thing. You can always uh, fire your doctor. I, I guess I'm very lucky to be a physician on one level. Uh, I, I've been on, on another level. I've been my own doctor for 18, 19 years now, and I, I think I should uh, double my, my, uh, uh, my charge to myself. <laughs> So if I'm if I'm hearing you what it seems to me you're also really talking about is somebody you can have a relationship with who who's going to talk to you in a way that where you feel like a human being. Yes, but I also believe that there probably are certain uh, uh physicians that do procedures that you really just want someone who's really really good at the procedure and when you've got an interventional radiologist Having that person really listen to you to help you make decisions that are uh, is probably not quite as important as having someone who's really, really good at what they're doing and understands the anatomy. And you know, there's some very, very gifted proceduralists out there and surgeons. Um, and there are, um, you know, they have good days, bad days, uh, lucky days. Uh, anyway, it's a, uh, it's a, it's. When I say it's a dance, it's uh, like the music can get pretty serious, and sometimes the music kind of stops. Um, I, I was uh, uh, 
they did a intervention to try and decompress uh, swollen veins in my that they thought I was bleeding from in 2012, and I think I'd had I don't know something near 35 units of blood and had uh, almost arrested at one point and. And a team did a, a new and tricky decompression procedure that, that involved, you know, some special anatomical approaches. And they were really excited about it, presented the case in rounds at Boston at a bunch of uh, their peers and other institutions. And then later on, I started bleeding again. And they went back in and saw that this one of these stents that they put in it was all clotted. And, and I'm, I'm conscious. I'm a little sedated, but I can hear, you know... You can just tell that they are bummed out just by the way they're whispering. You can just oh, you can you, hear you can you, hear. I this? could hear them whispering as they were, you know, trying to get catheters, uh, you know, in in through my legs and stuff. And you could, yeah, you know, no, I was I was very aware that something had gone wrong, but uh, I got lucky uh, uh, ten days later and things st- I stopped bleeding. No one knows why. Well, your your decision to expand your education to hospice and palliative care, can you tell me a little about that? I should mention that palliative care is not understood well by by physicians or uh, the public. Um, and uh, because it was kind of came out of the hospice movement, uh, both of those groups tend to think, oh, that means we're giving up. Mm-hmm. Or and sometimes surgeons will say, well, I did something palliative, which meant... It's not, there's no cure here. It's just going to help symptoms. But palliative care is, is um, a, new, a new certified sp- subspecialty of multiple specialties, like internal medicine and family medicine, emergency medicine, that, that, that get um, more training and then uh, have to go to a certain number of uh, team meetings and do a certain amount of end-of-life care work and then they become eligible to take a certifying exam. Uh, and I think roughly 60% or 65% of hospitals in the country now have palliative care programs where uh, the trigger for getting a palliative care team involved would be if you wouldn't be surprised if this person died from a life-limiting disease or life-threatening illness in the next 12 months. And that applies to a lot of the feeble uh, elderly and uh, People with multiple chronic diseases, people with a, a dementia. I mean, there's, and and so what palliative care does is by bringing in a, a team of people who are expertly trained on in terms of coordinating care, in terms of communication, and in terms of symptom management. There's like a whole nother level of support for people in this complex time where. You know, emotions are going up. People, sometimes the patients are losing their ability to think and cognate uh, clearly. Uh, and uh, uh, just when things are ratcheting up and more and more uh, uh, physicians and sp- uh, specialists are involved, and so things get confused of who's in charge. And so uh, palliative care can help sort all that out. And it doesn't mean giving up. It, it, it's it, as much involved in looking for cure or optimal treatment of uh, And, and of, would, that of be, would that be like a hallmark difference? Since the two are often used together, hospice and palliative care, I do think that there's often confusion. Would, would that be one of the differences that you're still looking for cure with palliative care? Uh, potentially? You, you can be if it's appropriate and uh, achievable or what the patient wants to go for, absolutely yes. Now, where the hospice, um, well, the federal government's definition of who's eligible to receive the hospice benefit, meaning have Medicare pay for the hospice, uh, they have to have two physicians that will sign uh, a paper saying that if the disease follows its expected course, they will be dead in six months. And, um, but currently, there are something like 140 program, uh, uh, experimental programs in, that Medicare is doing on hospice that includes curative treatment. And some of the big studies that really have been interesting have shown that patients who get either palliative care or sometimes go to hospice live longer than people that don't. 
And it's actually not that hard to understand because if you have someone who cares how you feel and is helping you out with every problem that comes up, your quality of life is improved. And so it's not surprising that people live longer. And a big study that came out in, I think it was 2011, uh, uh, Dr. Temel at Harvard and her colleagues showed in people with um, terminal lung cancer that those that had palliative care consults lived 25% longer and had higher quality of life scores. They, were, they and their families felt that their quality of life was much improved. So even though most of them that had these palliative care consults decided not to have um, aggressive therapy, more of them chose to have hospice referral, and that often just means teams that come and visit and help support you at home. But, uh, but no, you're absolutely right. Uh, in, it's a big problem that many families and patients don't even want to think about palliative care, much less hospice, because it immediately brings up this red flag that they're giving up, they're not going to do anything for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, even some people might think, oh, they're going to save money on me by not doing anything. And uh, the evidence has really emerged that that quality of life and often the length of life is 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 better sometimes money is saved and that's not a bad thing given that the institute of medicine reported in 2010 that uh one-third of all health care dollars spent in this country are wasted that's 750 billion dollars in one year that is more than is uh, spent on all K through 12 education in the country. It sounds like from what you're saying that palliative care it, uh, always includes a team, if I'm hearing you right. Well, or it should is, include it, there, a team. there is a team, yes. Actually, this palliative care gets a social worker, a chaplain, uh, an advanced nurse practitioner, along with a, with a physician that's very uh, experienced in the nuances of this kind of these conditions. Mm-hmm. And the level of understanding is going up. Patients and their family are understanding more about the landscape that they're facing. Uh, people are are able to uh, articulate what their fears are, what their what their past experiences, what they've seen go badly. This sort of shifts us over a little bit to the the idea of uh, of the physician assisted dying, or what some people would call hastening uh, dying. And some other people would call physician-assisted suicide, uh, which is was signed into law by the governor of California last October. And so now, one in six Americans lives in a state where physician-assisted dying is legal. Part of what has driven this is that the experience of many Americans has been they've seen people die terribly or they've seen people prolonged and and come to realize that, gosh, there are things worse than death. And so what has happened around the country is, and is, is probably hit a turning point, is people want, I want a way out if I have an, ex, you know, if I end up in a situation that's intolerable and I don't have a physician that knows me well enough that for me to trust them. Patients want autonomy, dignity. They don't want. Some don't want to be a burden to their family. Uh, some of them may don't may not want their family to go bankrupt, paying medical bills. Uh, incidentally, we have currently on an, on an annual basis 1.7 million uh, uh, Americans that live in households that have gone bankrupt from medical bills. One of the thought leaders in palliative care, Dr. Ira Bayak. Uh, has said that he has never had a case where a patient is uh, needed physician-assisted uh, dying. And he's quite articulate and opposed to it because he thinks if palliative care uh, techniques uh, are sufficient, that there's excellent symptom management. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering for you, given now, I mean, you have such strong background in all of this from an intellectual standpoint. You've also had all these brushes um, with your own medical problems. What's um, what's this look like for you? Do you have a palliative care team? Would you? Um, 
I guess I, I want to turn it over to in terms of your own care. Well, when I was hospitalized in 2011 and 2012, I had palliative care rounding on me, meaning the team would come by and visit. And actually, I, I knew the, the doctor very well, and she was uh, very supportive and very helpful. Uh, she also just kept telling my family to get ready because I'm going to die soon. So she was wrong. I mean, that was four years ago. Knock on wood. I'm you know, going to continue to to uh, strategize and, and uh, play whack-a-mole with my uh, tumor and the complications of the treatments, which are often as bad as the, the disease itself. Um, I don't think we should get too friendly with death. I just think it's much more complicated than one or two conversations. I sort of want to go day by day, but I have real fears around some of the possibilities. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, I have uh, uh, my digestive tract is missing a number of organs and it's been cut up and radiated and had uh, all kinds of procedures. So I don't absorb a, a lot of food that I eat. And I have to eat a lot of food and take a lot of digestive enzymes. And sometimes I have to take insulin. And you know, it's a pretty complex effort to keep my weight on. And I'm thin uh, and don't have much of a margin to lose. But if I were to become uh, unable to do my own toileting, uh, and I was still needed to have a large number of calories put into me, the, the, frankly, the, the body care is something I don't really want someone else to do that I love. I don't want them having to deal with that volume of, uh, of stool. Uh, I mean, part of me is, you know, if I really get to that point that I can't take care of that, I'm, I might not uh, want to be around. I guess I hear as you're talking both the like awareness of focusing on on the day and the now and yet having also having a broader view of of what could happen knowing that we don't have a whole lot of control when um when I was in the hospital for 35 days in a row it was a winter and my I craved sunlight and I finally found one spot in, in a little recess by an elevator where there was this uh, ceiling to floor window where the sun directly came in. And I would go squeeze into that spot from 10.30 to 11.30 in the morning because that's the only place that I could access direct sunlight. When I left the when I was discharged from the hospital uh, after some bleeding in, uh, in June and uh, I had to sneak out of the hospital virtually to watch my, my twins graduate from high school uh, and uh, uh, going to see them graduate from college, it looks like. Um, I went to our front garden, and I sat in the sunlight, and I looked at the garden, and I watched a, a bumblebee flying, a big bumblebee, loud, and a butterfly and I was in heaven. I just loved the feeling of that sunshine and the, the presence of that garden. And I think I try to hold on to that. You know, sometimes I'm in traffic, you know, trying to get through the construction to get to yoga, to relax, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm all wound up. But I try to keep a little of that memory uh, because it really does infuse all of our days if we let it. So I like to I like to hold on to that. I think I also try to be open to the unexpected. Uh, I think Thomas Aquinas had a term for that, which I can't remember the Latin for for being open to the unexpected, which which is that you know rather rather than just being habitual and uh, getting your uh, dopamine released by all those uh, familiar ways is to be open to the unexpected in, in your day-to-day -day experiences and just sort of observe and participate. Dancing, 
singing. I love them. That's great. And I guess before we close, I'm wondering for you, what is it that you imagine happens when you die? So I do have an open mind that some of the mystics with uh, some of these uh, uh, understandings may be really on to something. Uh, but I think that uh, that nonetheless, at some of the time as I approach, you know, uh, later uh, towards the end of my life, I'll, I'll nonetheless be in that zone, th- that domain where there's, you know, some depression and some melancholy about the, the uh, uh, coming end of my life and, uh, uh, you know, sort of <laughs> what we call in my family FOMO, fear of missing out. <laughs> uh, but um, gosh, you know what, what, you know, what makes it bearable is that it's our humanity. We all share this. Yeah. So it's not like I'm out there on my own doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of in this, this dance with all the rest of humanity that's alive or will be alive or has died. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I tend to look for the uh, silver lining in these uh, dark clouds of, uh, you know, apprehension and concern that come up. I know it was Mark Twain that said 99% of his worst fears never happened. (laughs) This seems like a great place for us to stop, Joe. You've taken us on this journey of going from doctor to patient, and I so appreciate your willingness to share a bit about what it has been like for you to face the possibility of death. Learning about palliative care is encouraging. At a time that most people feel powerless, this mode of care presents choices. I'm hoping we can use what we've learned here to implement those choices. So I want to thank you for being here. Uh, It was a pleasure, Ariana. Thank you. The word death evokes all sorts of personal feelings, images, and stories. These stories are compelling, and sharing them connects us more fully to life. I'm Ariane Alfont, and you've been listening to Death, the podcast. Join us for our next episode in this series. This show is produced and engineered by Eric Merle. Our associate producer is Jill Gross. Our theme music, It Happened, is written by David Milling and is performed by David Milling and Charles Milling. To hear more of David's music, go to his website, davidmilling.com. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher or some other podcast app, if you can take a moment to rate and review us, that helps other people find us. You can find Death the Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, or at deaththepodcast.com. Death the Podcast is a production of INO Broadcasting. You know Labor Day signals the unofficial end of summer, but not the end of your outdoor projects. Lowe's helps you do it right and helps you save with Labor Day deals throughout the store. Shop now and get two bags of Stay Green Potty Mix for $12. And keep your lawn looking neat and trim with a Craftsman 2-Cycle 17-inch gas string trimmer, now $20 off at just $119. Whatever's still on your to-do list this Labor Day, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Offers valid through 828. Soil offer excludes Alaska and Hawaii, U.S. only.